There's a weapon in Elden Ring that has been repeatedly nerfed over every single major patch since release. They are shell their former selves, having their true combos completely removed, their damage gutted, and despite being battered, beaten, and broken, the weapon continues to inspire terror in Redditors who will then return to their modeling thread to shout to the void, Game bad. Hi, my name's Rest. I'm an Elden Ring content creator with an emphasis on PvP. In this video I'll be going over an in-depth guide on optimal use of heavy thrusting swords, including the frame data, fundamentals, movement tech, its strength and weaknesses, ashes of war, and build optimization. If you enjoyed the video or find the information helpful at all, be sure to drop a like and subscribe to my channel for more content, and go check me out over on Twitch, because, you know, I do things and stuff. The Heavy Thrusting Sword, or HTS, is a middling weapon with niche capabilities. It has poor standing R1 attacks, even worse crouch attacks, but incredible jumping and running attacks. For all intents and purposes, you should almost always be using the two-handed moveset, as a lot of the tech with the weapon requires it to be two-handed. This weapon doesn't do well in close quarters due to having 18 startup frames on its R1, which is literally slower than a greatsword. The follow-up R1-2 is quite a bit faster at 15 frames, but remains slower than the power stance tree swords meaning that if your standing R1 doesn't poise break, you will always be out-traded by power stance straight swords. R2s are very situational, and they have 24 strata frames, which, once again, is slower than a greatsword. Your rolling R1 is honestly just a disappointment and should never be used. It's sort of a meme though, because it got nerfed in one of the previous patches due to a misunderstanding on the part of FromSoft, who kept hearing about how overtuned regular thrusting swords crouch attacks were, so they nerfed both weapons just in case. But the rolling attack has 14 startup frames, while the crouch attack itself has 15 startup frames. The running R1 is the exact same startup as the running R2, but without the benefit of the R2's incredible root motion. The increased range of the running R2 isn't all that it's cracked up to be though. While the root motion can offer a lot of phantom range when playing on high latency, it's very easily strafable and susceptible to backstabs. With that being said, the one-handed running R2 is generally a better option. It has the same startup as the two-handed variant, but with less recovery, making it much more difficult to punish. But it doesn't poise break against full bullgoat, so keep that in mind. Its jump attacks are rather interesting, and much of the playstyle centers around optimal use of various techs related to jump attacks. The JR1 has only 11 startup frames and 4 active frames of the attack. This is by far the strongest move in the kit, and has less recovery frames than its standing attack. The HTS comes with a unique R2 cancel, similar to curved swords and thrusting swords, which allow you to cancel out of the R2 attack into a retreating attack. The attack itself has an 8 frame startup after the initial R2 charge, and it can be a great tool to counter someone who's trying to whiff punish. This attack is actually bugged on the Godskin Stitcher, and only does 83 poise damage. This is not the case for every other heavy thrusting sword, which does the correct amount of poise damage. So great, you've got a bunch of numbers, and now, how do you use them? HTS relies heavily on a style of play that the community has coined as bunny hops, which is the utilization of instant momentum jumps in order to maintain sprint speed while jumping, and disguising your animations with your movement. It's similar to wave dashing, but with less goblin and more rabbit. The thing that makes b hop so fundamental to the playstyle of the HTS is a combination of both the 11 startup frames and the 4 active frames of the hitbox. A jump attack with an HTS is a mix-up of its own. The startup of the attack is incredibly fast, and pressures an opponent to roll in order to get out of danger. But, if the attack is delayed to its landing frames, it becomes a roll catch. Add on to that, if the opponent delays their roll and rolls expecting the delayed attack, the HTS can then roll catch with an empty jump into a running R2. This inspires a deadly game of rock, paper, scissors with your opponent, and your job is to condition them into reacting the way that you want them to. One of the biggest mistakes that people make when playing with an HTS is playing locked on to their opponent. This weapon generally has terrible tracking on all of its attacks, but if you take a side angle view of the hitbox during a jump attack, you'll notice that the tip of the weapon points up, and it's very common for someone to simply crouch and avoid getting hit altogether. To avoid this, you have to angle your camera down in order to connect your hits, otherwise you'll be swinging over their head. If anything, it's best to only lock on at the last few frames of your attack to ensure that the attack connects. With being unlocked, you can rotate your character a full 180 degrees with the delayed jump attack, and stop someone from running you down. There's a few weapons in the game with the unique feature of having increased mobility within certain frames of their attack. Great Spear JR1, Serpent Hunter Crouch Poke, Colossal Sword Crouch Poke, Offhand Thrusting Sword, all have the ability to sweep their hitbox, giving them some horizontal coverage during their poke animations. HDS has this in its jump attack, more so the JR1. 
The JR1 is unique in that it has 4 active frames of its hitbox, allowing you to sweep the hitbox almost a full 360 degrees, something that other weapons can't achieve. Timing is precise for you to effectively sweep the hitbox though, and it starts as you come down from the jump, into the landing frames of your animation. As long as you sweep the hitbox during these frames, your hitbox will be active wherever you see the white trail leading behind the weapon. A backwards jump can be performed by starting locked on, move the direction stick down, jump, then unlock. If you angled your stick to the left or right, then your character will jump facing away from that direction. A reverse jump can be performed by starting unlocked, moving away from your opponent. Jump, then flick the direction stick into the opposite direction immediately following the jump. If you change direction too late, or you lock on before you've secured your direction, then the reverse jump will fail. An instant momentum jump allows you to maintain sprint speed with consecutive jumps where you might otherwise get a short hop. You can perform an instant momentum jump by holding block and sprint as you land. As your weapon shifts back into the block position, press jump again. If you press too early, your jump input will be eaten by the block animation, but it's still faster than sprint jumping normally. You can pivot a full 180 degrees out of an empty jump by changing direction during the landing frames of the jump. The pivot gets cancelled by the animation of your character landing, so as long as you change direction during those frames, you're good. Neutral is the space between you and your opponent that determines who gets priority on their attack based on several factors like weapon range, poise, hyper armor, health advantage, and latency. Before the fight even starts, you have to consider the matchup you're facing. Only your R2s will poise break someone with over 125 poise, or if someone is using a weapon with hyper armor. And your sending attacks will always be in disadvantage against fast weapons since your attack speed is so slow. Keeping count of your opponent's poise is extremely important if you want to whiff punish with R1s, Otherwise, you'll be confined to using your jump attacks and R2s. Out of neutral, it's important to begin to condition your opponent to react in you in a certain way. You can decondition them with empty jumps in order to get them comfortable with the idea that you tend to jump without going for an attack, reducing their reactivity to when you jump at them. Thus begins the game of Rock, Paper, Scissors, where you start to mix up the timing of your jump attacks to either hide your jump, delay jump attacks, or landing running R2s. Spacing is incredibly important for this weapon, but thanks to the ability to sweep your hitbox, you can play pretty close to your opponent as long as you can avoid their anti-air. Strafe jumping is a form of unlocked movement where you can jump diagonally from your opponent to avoid getting hit by the natural moveset of the opponent's weapon. Against most weapons, you'll simply never be able to jump out a hit stun, but you want to be close enough by the time that you land that your sweeping attack will connect with your opponent. Something that can make this a lot more reliable is backwards jumps, which can turn your character around so that you don't have to delay your attack and risk your opponent anticipating the strafe. The HTS does fairly well at dealing with highly reactive opponents with the ability to mix up its timings and weave and roll catches with rock, paper, scissors. Otherwise, an offhand dagger can do a lot of work to further pressure rolls out of someone who's playing very reactively. If you're able to hit with a dagger, then you're likely to connect with a one-handed running R2 if they fail to react roll the dagger. The best dashes of the war for the weapon are the ones that generally help it deal with the lack of pressure that it has against aggressive poise monsters. Things that have a guaranteed poise break or provide hyper armor greatly support the weapon. Storm Stomp and Flaming Strike are good for opponents with low poise with pseudo combos available to help set up for these ashes. Chilling Mist is a great option as a roll catch with the added bonus of hyper armor and is probably one of the best ashes for the weapon. Raptors of the Mist is a great option to give you immediate access to your jump attacks, but can be easily punished if your opponent has access to anti-air on their moveset. Windstone Phalanx can help you set up a frame trap if you can position yourself well enough by either guaranteeing that you hit through the stagger of the Phalanx, or you roll catch with R2. This is risky to set up though, as the cast time is quite long. Crag Blade is probably the best Asher War that you can use against someone with high poise, guaranteeing a poise break on someone that might otherwise tank or hit. The HTS is a unique weapon that can run a number of different build options and still be quite viable. The Bloody Helis with an offhand Occult Wakazashi can be incredible in an arcane build, but every other build favors the Godskin Stitcher. With that being said, a pure strength, dex, or arc build are optimal, running heavy, keen, or arcane invasions respectively. Meet the base requirements of the weapon, get 60 vigor and enough endurance to be able to carry your maximum quick load, and pour the rest of the points into whichever build type that you want to invest to. Strength and dexterity result in pretty much the same outcome, the dex is generally considered better just for the access to higher damage when one-handing, so that you can make more effective use of an off-dagger. For talismans, I'll likely have a full guide on optimizing your talisman loadout coming out in the future, but specifically for this, Spear Talisman is a must, and you can choose between Claw for consistent damage or Opt for Exaltation Talismans if you plan to run a status. 
Poise is less important here since you aren't looking to trade a whole lot with this weapon, but you can definitely make life a little bit easier for you if you run Bullguts Talisman. The HTS is in a very weird place in the meta. It doesn't have the damage, poise damage, or speed required to keep pace and competitive on paper, but with utilizing the various techs that the weapon benefits so greatly from, it continues to hold its own despite its flaws. It can be a very difficult weapon to make work, but when you can put all the pieces together, it becomes an absolute nightmare. For me, I find it the most fun weapon to play with requiring strategic positioning, mix-ups, mind games, and technical movement, and when it pays off, it's incredible. I hope this video was helpful to some of you, and maybe gave you some insight on what you can do to improve your use of the weapon. I need to offer credit to my mentors who taught me how to use the weapon and trained me tirelessly over the past 6 months to help get me to where I am today, being SKJFRD, Scorpion, and Sip, otherwise known as Frosty Jr., otherwise known as Cup. And be sure to leave a comment down below if this video is helpful to you at all, or what I can do to improve in the future.